So adding ICS as a controller reduces the probability of serious adverse outcomes in a population level. This came from the risk of mild asthma where Saba alone is discarded. Because when we look at the risk of the serious adverse events, in acute asthma, around 30 to 37 percentage of adults are having mild asthma in the background. When it comes to near fatal asthma, it's around 16 percentage. And death in the mortality of asthma, at least 15 to 20 percentage of them are having only mild asthma in the background. That means even though we call it mild asthma, they have higher, there is a higher risk of serious adverse events, which can lead up to death. And mild asthma can have these exacerbations because we know that the exacerbation triggers are very unpredictable. And just starting with the short acting beta agonist will not give pr protection against this uh, risk of exacerbation. And once, uh, once the exacerbation is set in, it can go to any extent. So another thing is when we start the treatment with Saba, patient do consider it as a primary treatment and consider it as the treatment modality. And they will stick on to Saba, Saba and Saba PRN or Saga, Saba continuously, which will affect the further asthma management. So based on this and various studies which have shown that uh, there is significant adverse effects on using Saba quite frequently or continuously. So if there is a regular use of Saba for even one to two weeks, it can downregulate the beta receptors. It can decrease the bronco protection effect of bronco protection effect of the same medicine and other medicines, and it can have a rebound hyper responsiveness. It can also decrease the bronco dilator response to a particular drug. And in fact, it can increase the allergic response and increase eosinophilic airway inflammation. So we say Saba is good for a short duration, for a few days. But if we go on taking it, it will have the negative effects rather than its, its own positive effects. And if there's a higher use of Saba, like uh, if they use three canisters of uh, salbutamol per year, mainly because they use it most of the in most of the days, then it's associated with a higher risk of very severe exacerbations. And if they start using uh, short acting beta agonist almost every day throughout the year, leading to around 12 canisters per year, it is associated with a higher risk of death. Based on this, in 2019 guidelines, they said uh, no more Saba alone treatment. So based on that, GNA 2021 gives two choices, two tracks to say. So track one is where we should use a low dose ICS or formatrol and formatrol combination as a reliever instead of Saba. And it is the preferred approach because, uh, because the ICS in this will help in uh, decreasing the risk for exacerbations. And there's a track two, which say, okay, Saba as a reliever with some modifications. This track two is not the preferred approach, but it is an approach when there's track one is not possible because of the uh, patient's own condition or the disease condition. But what we need to do is we need to assess the adherence with the daily controller. If the patient is ready to take a daily controller that's low ICS, then we can say short acting beta agonists can be used as a um, reliever instead of uh, forcing on ICS for material combination. But if the patient is on an ICS LABA medication for a controller, then we can't say Saba alone as a reliever. We have to stick on to ICS formatrol as a reliever. And also, if you're using ICS formatrol as a reliever, then we don't have to phenotype the asthma further. If we are not, and we are using only Saba, then we need to see what phenotype, where, out of the various phenotypes, what phenotype is this patient having, and whether he will be benefited from the uh, use of uh, inhaled corticosteroids as a reliever. And we can step up or down within a track or switch between the tracks if we find that one track is not uh, doing the job. So here, we have two tracks, unlike the previous GINA guidelines, we have track one and track two. Uh, to start on treatment, we need to, as usual, we need to confirm the diagnosis, I look at the symptom control and modify the risk factors which we can modify. Look at the comorbidities. And we need to look at the inhaler technique and the appearance every time that the patient comes back to us. And we have to consider the patient's preference and then goals as well. 
Now, coming to the track one. The track one, as you said, uses ICS formatrol as a lever and it uh, supposed to reduce the risk of exasperations compared with the track two, where the SARP is a lever. Now, when we look at the both the tracks, the predominant, the step three, step four, and step five is almost the same, almost the same. Whereas step one and two is combined in the track one, where it is divided to different step one and step two in the track two, where SARP is used as a lever. So in step one and two is where we use low-dose ICS format role as a as required. I mean, there's no controller per se. We can use it as a reliever. And step three is when, uh, so step one and two is when symptoms is less than four to five days a week. And step three, when the symptoms is on most of the days, we should start with step three. And uh, when there is at least a uh, sleep disturbance of a day in a week, uh, we have to start on low dose maintenance ICS format role as a controller. And then the same can be used as a reliever as well. When the, there's a daily symptoms and uh, also the lung function is also affected in the spirometry, then we need to hike up to a median dose a maintenance with the ICF format law. And still is not under control, uh, then we need to add on LAMAS or any other um, biologicals uh, depending on the uh, severity of the disease. But again, step four, uh, when we're starting somebody on step four, as we usually do, we can give a short course of oral steroids for the initial control. Now, coming to the track two, here step one, we can do uh, take a uh, short acting beta agonist as a reliever, but take ICS also along with that. Take another IC, do SABA, but not SABA alone if it's step one, because we are not do, using ICS as a controller there. Step two, so that is when, uh, step one is when symptoms are less than twice a month. And step two is actually the criteria for step one, one, one or two in track one. There's a symptoms of twice a month or more, but less than four to five days a week. There we had to start on low dose uh, ICS as a maintenance. From step three, four, five is same as track one, but the uh, say ICS LABA, not necessarily ICS formal code because tra track one is based on a single drug. And uh, so it just, we will stick on to ICS format flow and track two when we are using another ICS lab. And again, when we are using ICS lab, as I said before, as a controller, then we need to use ICS lab as a reliever. I, I, mean, I mean, ICS format flow as a reliever. So evidence in step two, why we need to use ICS format flow. So combined with the SABA alone treatment, the severe exasperations are reduced by around two third in ICS format flow group. And there's a greater reduction in, in the excise induced bronchoconstriction as well. When compared with maintenance low dose ICS with as and required needed SABA, the advantages of the ICS format control therapy is when you look at the severe exasperation, there is it is non-inferior, and some studies show there's a superiority also. But looking at the ICS dose, we can uh, uh, keep the ICS dose reduced to around 25 to 50 percentage of the other wing. And symptom control, there's no uh, significant difference. Lung function per se, there's no significant difference. And FENO also, there's no significant difference. And exercise induced bronchoconstriction, because ISIS is already on uh, uh, in this one, so there's no significant difference. So the two differences comes when with the, uh, especially with the severe exasperations and as the, as, uh, the dose reduction in the regular ICS dose. Again, uh, uh, like the previous guidelines, uh, there's a low, medium, and a high dose ICS dose table. But with a note that this is not a table of equivalence. We can't say that uh, beclomethasone dipropionate of around 200 to 500 is equivalent to a of 200 to 400. No. Considering the same steroid as an inhaled particular steroid, in the same steroid, it's divided into low, medium, and high. We, and we can compare the dose sizes. Uh, among the groups, among the steroids. So other changes is on in GINA 2021 is the, the de definition of mild asthma. And the current definition is asthma that is able to be well controlled with reliever alone or low dose ICS, but severity cannot be assessed until the patient has been on treatment for several months. So uh, here uh, in GINA 2021, they don't... Um, consider the, the, the commit the definitions to 
any of the severity of the illness or the um, chances of exacerbation this uh, stick on to just what medicine is being used so when there is a mild asthma it just means that it is well controlled with reliever alone or low dose ics nothing about the patient's own severity of uh, sinus per se and so, so for the same reason it does not distinguish between the intermittent and mild persistent asthma and which it also comes with the note that uh, it will be reviewed during 2021 and presented in the next gina guidelines uh, about attaching the severity to the asthma mild asthma definitions again with a severe asthma to avoid com confusion it is reworded like as uh, severe asthma is reworded as the asthma that remains uncontrolled despite optimized treatment with high dose ics laba or that requires a high dose ics laba to prevent from becoming uncontrolled again it's uh, just about the control and the medications and then there's no uh, uh, nothing per se about the severity and the chances of exacerbation and the type of symptoms they have again lama is an add on in step 5 and for age group above 6 years that means 6 to 18 years it can be added as a separate inhaler if symptoms are not under control and 18 years onwards and above can be added as a triple combination and remember adding lama will improve the lung function but not the symptoms at least by studies and you know, it can be increase the time to severe exacerbation acetromycin can be added for significantly reduces exacerbation so before adding on acetromycin we need to check the sputum for atypical mycobacteria and check ecg for long qtc and we need to recheck after a month of acetromycin treatment whether it has any influence on the uh, qt interval and also consider the risk of increasing the antimicrobial resistance both in a population per se population per se and for individuals there's a note on the biological therapy and the special indications in way patavirum sir will be elaborating on the same omalizumab especially for chronic idiopathic urticaria and nasal polyposis there mepolizumab mepolizumab which is a uh, anti il5 uh, for hyper eosinophilic syndrome and uh, igpa bendralizumab is also an anti il5 and there's no additional indication than before uh, not uh, nothing addition to the mepolizumab indications and dupilumab which is anti il4 and il13 Uh, especially for chronic sinus sinusitis with noisy polyposis and atopic dermatitis coming to children now children doesn't have two tracks it's a single track where step 1 is low dose ics taken whenever sub is taken like our track 1 sorry like uh, track 2 uh, where symptoms is less than 2 hm month and in step 2 is symptoms twice a month or more but less than daily and the daily low dose ICS can be used, and at that moment we can make, can add a daily leukotriene receptor antagonist or low dose ICS or SABA as PR medications, and can be used as controller, uh, extra controller also option also. And uh, step three again symptoms most days or taking with asthma once a week or more is almost the same low dose ICS with LABA or medium dose ICS without LABA, and or we can start with the very low dose ICS for much more therapy. So this is from six to eleven years, and step four is medium dose ICS laba or low dose ICS formatural maintenance and reliever therapy. That's the same ICS formatural formulation, and then step five, uh, refer for phenotypic assessment, and then other add-on therapies for less children who are less than five. Step one is uh, especially because of the infrequent viral wheezing or no. Uh, a few intravel symptoms then we can consider step 1 and we can use this as ab as required and step 2 again daily low dose ics and under 5 difficult to uh, confirm diagnosis of asthma but then there's a symptom pattern is not consistent with asthma but we seeing episodes of recurring saba quite frequently and at least more than twice a year and we can give a diagnostic trial for 3 months and if the symptoms pattern consistent with asthma And the symptoms are again not well controlled, like in more than three. Then we can start from step two, means uh, giving a low dose ICS as a controller. And step three is uh, when asthma diagnosis and asthma is not well uh, is made or the asthma is not well controlled on low dose ICS. And before, as uh, in adults also, stepping up, we need to check the 
inhaler techniques we can add ltrs here also and step four is to continue controller and uh, same uh, refer for special so basically there's no role for laba in uh, less than five group it's only ics and increasing the ics dosage again there's a chart for the pediatric age group for 6 to 11 with the low medium and high ics doses comes with a tag because it's not uh, equivalent uh, there's not a comparison between the doses of various uh, in here particular steroids it's just grading of uh, high medium and uh, low medium and high dose steroids of a particular steroid same with the less than five years so uh, other changes in nutshell uh, especially it is coming a uh, hard on uh, clinical trials and observational studies uh, say when we describe a treatment we should not say which step treatment the patient is on because the indication for starting the patient on that particular step is not mentioned in most of studies and do not impute on severity as severity is taken off from the guidelines per se and uh, when we and it should be uh, all the groups should, should be truly based on what the treatment they are taken and rest is for uh, understanding or assumptions so don't mention step number and uh, do not impute on severity when we say uh, describe a particular group for example we should say we should say the patients is taking median dose isis laba and stop it there don't say on step four treatment or don't say it's a moderately severe asthma because it can vary very uh, over big, uh, on the uh, on multiple studies and difficult to undergo a meta analysis or comparison of various studies and again asthma control questionnaire we know there's a, there's asthma control questionnaire five and then a six version and then a seventh version difference between five and six is six adds on saba as a reliever and seven adds on spirometry to that and five is uh, mostly on symptoms like uh, what's the daytime symptoms so whether they are able to do the daily activity and the, the what are the nighttime symptoms getting us from sleep so acs q5 is easier to be uh, easier to be applied than six and seven even in uh, limited resource settings so acs q5 is uh, the interpretation of cut point cut points has been clarified and they say acq5 is preferred over acq6 and 7 especially in studies because of the flexibility of reliever options in uh, in uh, Q6 and to avoid the stepping up asthma treatment in patients with persistent airflow limitation. So this persistent airflow limitation which requires a higher treatment and uh, use of reliever which will change the category. This is all for 6 and 7. 5 is not assessing those. So 5 will give a uniformity for studies. And withholding the period for bronchodilators is updated according to ATS spirometry guidelines. And withholding the the bronchodilators before doing a spirometry to confirm the diagnosis for asthma for patients who are already on. Like SABA should be stored for four hours and twice daily LABA should be stored for 24 hours and once daily LABA should be stored for 36 hours prior to the spirometry. And the primary prevention of, of, of asthma, identification and correction of D insufficiency in women with asthma who are pregnant or planning pregnancy uh, so may reduce the risk of early life wheezing episodes. And uh, GINA guidelines uh, 2021 also take uh, an effort to answer the most frequently asked questions based on COVID-19 and asthma. And this is actually the first part of the uh, guidelines. Uh, I just put it to the last to conclude. Asthma patients do not appear to be at increased risk of acquiring COVID-19. People with well-controlled asthma are not at increased risk of COVID-19 related death. Risk of COVID-19 death was increased in three category of patients. That's people who had recently needed oral corticosteroid for their asthma, uh, who are uh, hospitalized patients with severe asthma. And in 2020, many countries also saw a reduction in asthma, sorry, uh, reduction, reduction in asthma exasperations and influenza-related illnesses. Most probably because uh, patient, uh, most of people are using uh, masks and there are lockdowns and they're bound to form. But Gina is not committing on why it reduced. And there's a, even though the guidelines are which, uh, kept on changing on nebulizers and uh, spirometry, we kept on changing initially, they said should not be done later. It was said uh, should be done, it can be done with uh, precautions. Uh, Gina says avoid nebulizers wherever possible to reduce the risk of spreading virus because it's a aerosol generating procedure. And avoid spirometry in patients with confirmed or suspected COVID-19 or 
if there's a community transmission of covid-19 going on in a region then better not to do because it can spread from asymptomatic patients to uh, carriers to uh, unaffected individuals and biological therapy and covid-19 vaccine should not be given on the same day just because adverse effects of either can be more easily uh, distinguished if they are given on separate day so given both on the same day and the, the patient uh, develop some sort of anaphylaxis and we won't know which one triggered it and uh, a gap of 14 days between covid-19 vaccination and influenza vaccination is recommended thank you thank you dr akil for that beautiful and crystal clear elaboration as usual Uh, we'll take the questions at the last. Um, so uh, I will invite Dr. Thomas for introducing the next speaker. Yeah, uh, Dr. Akil was saying about Jena updates that uh, severe asthma has been removed. So I think this is probably because newer interventions are coming up or uh, biologicals are coming up more frequently. We have a right person to speak about the role of biologicals. I'm sure that he's the one who is bringing newer interventions to India. Uh, many times and i'm very proud and it's my great pleasure to invite uh, dr patabi raman to speak about biologicals in bronchial asthma over to you patabi raman sir um, uh, thank you dr thomas uh, it's been lovely uh, it's always lovely to uh, you know address uh, apcc i have very very uh, fond memories of uh, association with uh, with the apcc in general and uh, i i i also like to thank astra for uh, uh, for this uh, so i thank uh, apt and astra specifically is my uh, slide visible uh, thomas yes visible all right so uh, yeah so i'll take over from where uh, paul left and uh, you know uh, uh, paul had uh, uh, given you some idea about how definition of what is new in uh, gina but my ro uh, my role here is very specific i'm just going to uh, talk about the role of biologics in severe asthma now uh, a, a brief about severe asthma which i think uh, uh, dr paul briefly alluded to but you know asthma is now very common more than 330 million people are uh, suffering from this and the most important uh, uh, component of asthma is the severe asthma severe uncontrolled asthma that is represents a very significant healthcare uh, uh, problem now why is it important why is dealing severe asthma important especially for specialists like us it's linked to the poor outcomes and medical emergencies you can see that about 92% of people who have severe uncontrolled asthma have their normal day to day activities impacted by some way or the other at least once a day and there is a 10 times increase in risk of hospitalization as compared to people with controlled asthma and in, in patients with severe uncontrolled asthma there is an increased mortality so there is activities of daily life uh, problem there is a hospitalization which is 10x and there is also increased death and there is a significant direct cost it's it's a direct economical uh, thing the people actually lose a lot of economic they they saving and so on when they have uncontrolled asthma see you can see this graph clearly shows about 60% of uh, 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 you know uh, healthcare expenditure is belongs to people who have uncontrolled severe asthma and the remaining uh, chunk of it is uncontrolled mild to moderate asthma so the important thing is to ensure that there is a control in what happens so severe asthma had many different uh, meanings and this is what dr paul had uh, alluded to it uh, what is the diagnosis of severe asthma this is a recent change now severe asthma is any asthma that requires treatment with high dose ics and a second controller for the previous year or addition of systemic steroids for at least 50% of previous year and or it remains uncontrolled despite all these therapies so even if the patient is on high high dose ics and a second controller and if you stop one of these then the patient goes back to uh, having symptoms that's also counted as severe asthma now what what happens in severe asthma severe asthma has a lot of uh, you know multiple phenotypes it's very important because there are, there needs to be a personalized treatment approach through a specialist care now mild and moderate if you follow gina guidelines you you by and large all right but if you have a severe asthma the uh, you know one size fits all doesn't work now why is that so because we are not a homogeneous group of people there are different ways in which people react to an aero allergen it might be on the left side of your screen you can be have a severe allergic phenotype typically starting from younger age group you have a propensity to have a, a you know plasma cell and a b cell uh, you know which 
activated B cell, liberating IgE, which uh, you know kind of degranulates mast cells and produce problems. Or you could have a severe eosinophilic phenotype. So what I told earlier was an allergic phenotype. You could have an eosinophilic phenotype, which invariably con confers a severity to the, to the disease, wherein a predominant action, a predominant uh, mediator is an interleukin-5, which kind of uh, you know gets attached to eosinophil and makes it an activated eosinophil, which again liberates and causes a lot of issues. Or it could be you know action with increase in airway smooth muscle and so here there will be a role for a lama laba combination and also it acts more like a uh, you know kind of uh, uh, less uh, reversibility and here is where bronchial thermoplasty has no unquestionable role uh, not that other areas you're going to question it it is a final common pathway so bronchial thermoplasty is relevant for all these phenotypes but that's a topic for a different day there is also a neutrophilic phenotype wherein the neutrophil gets activated and there is some role for a, uh, you know macrolides here so these are the kind of uh, uh, types of people that we have and each one have to go through different approach. So you have a different uh, ways of looking at it. You see a blood eosinophil and a sputum eosinophil on, on the y-axis and an x-axis showing IgE. So you could have high eosinophil, high IgE in an atopic asthma. You could have uh, you know higher IgE on this side. You could also have an atopic allergic wherein there will be a combination of both uh, you know, uh, uh, atopia and eosinophilia, which is seen here. And you could have a pure eosinophilic and non-allergic or called a non-atopic asthma, wherein there is a lower IgE, but a higher eosinophils, whereas a TH2 low asthma, wherein there is just a low IgE and a low eosinophil, which can be, uh, you know, managed with the microliots. And these typically are obese people. And so weight reduction is a very important thing and a bronchial thermoplasty as alluded to earlier in all four. So you have a higher eosinophilic and lower IgE, which is non-atopic, lower eosinophilic and higher allergic, which is atopic for which we love a omalisma, which is at least there for 20 years now. And this is the most common pattern where is this go I A to P and also eosinophil where there is a relevance for both omalizumab and anti IL-5 so that choice would depend on certain other parameters. So we could have a eosinophilic impact when there is an allergy which is mediated to IL-5. It activates eosinophil and eosinophil is just two things actually. So you have an inflammation which causes a pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines which have a direct impact on airway tissues. There are certain non-immune effects like allergic eosinophil, uh, uh, you know, activated eosinophils affecting multiple cell types, leading to narrowing of airways and mucus formation, which will render the patient with a very severe form of severe asthma. Now, there is also, it is interesting to note that there is a linearity between a blood eosinophil and asthma severity and control. And there have been multiple studies which have shown this seniority. Now, you can see here, there's a forest graph uh, that, that just shows that there is a from above downwards the amount of eosinophil peripheral blood eosinophils goes up and you could see the odds ratio of having either a severe exacerbation or acute respiratory events or overall asthma control has actually has a linearity now a severe exacerbation is when there is an asthma related hospitalization or a, a, a department uh, visit or a prescription for acute corticosteroids whereas there is a slight difference between acute respiratory events and severe uh, things these are dependent on, I mean, all this has been uh, taken from 12 to 18 years of uh, things and uh, they, they just depended on uh, which studies they've used and they show if there is an acute respiratory event wherein, apart from what happens in severe exacerbation, there's also antibiotic use and overall asthma control depending on how much of uh, your uh, salbutamol or terbutalin is used. You could see that eosinophil increases severity of exacerbations and also the uh, lack of control shows up as there is a higher uh, amount of eosinophil. So eosinophil has something that can worsen asthma, both in terms of severity and also worsen the control of asthma. How do you recognize the severe eosinophilic asthma? So it's not only about serum eosinophils, you can also have clues. There are clinical indicators when a patient has a very severe asthma with frequent exacerbations, uh, low lung functions, and has a very good oral steroid responsiveness for a short while. And it typically, there is a comorbidity including a chronic rhinosinusitis with a nasal polyp. Typically, these people have a middle age, you know, onset of asthma is in middle age, not very early as in allergic asthma. So, in eosinophilic asthma, 
non atopic eosinophilic asthma typically or the frequent exacerbators with low lung function oral steroid responsiveness with comorbidities the most important thing is the rhinosinusitis with the nasal polyp coming to what are the approved biologicals there are three biologicals approved in the country at the moment first is been there for ages omalizumab indication very clearly patient should have a moderate to severe persistent asthma for more than 6 years of age so this is uh, been proven for even 7 year kid there has to be a positive test for perineal aerologen which can be either in form of skin prick test or a fadiotop uh, ige specific igsa the dose is the following there is a, there is up to 750 in fact someone uh, and now it is up between 750 to 1000 also is approved is it so sorry, no, and it is not your constitution hello so we need civil society participation hello can you hear me is there an issue yeah yeah we, i think uh, someone is not muted oh okay okay sorry um, and the adverse effect is anaphylaxis the most important thing there are uh, there have been other which been uh, I mean, not very common, so you don't need to be put off with all these malignancies, cardiovascular, dermatologic, and neuromuscular events. There are very, very few and far in between. Mepolizumab came earlier. Mepolizumab is an anti-IL-5. It's it's an add-on for maintenance for severe asthma in ages more than 12 years with the eosinophilic phenotype. So, patient has to mandatorily be an eosinophilic phenotype. The dose is 100 milligrams subcutaneous every month. again these are the uh, local site reaction being the most common uh, uh, thing and the bendralizumab is the latest it's again the indication has already been alluded to is just about same as what mepolizumab has only difference in egpa is what dr paul had said egpa has a problem with uh, mepolizumab because you might have to high, have a higher dosage 100 mi- uh, mg might not be enough and you might have to increase the dosage but because bendralizumab the way it works it's a receptor antibody not an anti il5 it's an anti il5 receptor antibody so the dose escalation is not required now this dose for the first 3 is a monthly and subsequently it is once in 2 months so that is the dosage advantage of bendralizumab so what are the biomarkers you typically look at when you when you talk in terms of severe asthma you look at blood eosinophil count very use very useful and very easy it predicts the responsiveness to steroid therapy particularly in children and clinical efficacy of il5 uh, therapy approaches in patients with severe asthma uh, you know asthma and uh, exacerbations I- ige was specifically to rule out an anti ige uh, you know to lo- to look at the atopic asthma and also to uh, you know uh, get the dosage right as far as omalizumab is concerned pheno is also useful it's just a surrogate of airway inflammation and usually reflects a eosinophilic inflammation and so that will be also useful and sputum eosinophil count is very difficult to do so uh, it 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 kind of uh, you know echoes what happens in the blood eosinophil count so, so the first uh, thing to come was anti ige the omalizumab so the thing is <clears throat> when there is a subset of patients with allergic or allergic eosinophilic phenotype the beta cell will uh, you know uh, increase the plasma cell to release ige the ige goes free there is a free ige then there will be a uh, it just gets attached to the mast cell in that receptors and it releases soluble mediators causing allergic inflammation when you throw omalizumab it binds to the free ige and these two bind together and hence they cannot bind in this uh, mast cell so the decreases uh, they decreases the expression of high affinity receptors because there is no ige sitting here so there is a reduction in uh, the receptors as, uh, as well so there is a decrease in mediator release <coughs> and there is a decrease in allergic inflammation so how do you select the patient it's an add on therapy it improves control with 6 years of elderly or uh, 6 year or more and severe persistent asthma with a positive skin test or a rash with a reduction of lung function so patient has to be qualified for this only if you have a less of uh, you know fev1 Uh, less than 80 percent with frequent symptoms, multiple exacerbation, receiving high dose uh, lava, and uh, there have been a lot of uh, studies. So I just want to just show uh, the most recent one, which shows a systematic review of 42 studies published between 2008 to 2019. This came out in 2019. There is a group of people from the United States. They just looked at short and long term real world effectiveness of omalizumab because the uh, proof of the pudding is in eating. 
and so real world scenario will be more important than you know very strictly uh, done a, a, a rigorously conducted clinical trial uh, in wow. a phase 3 setting here in this systematic review 42 real world studies showed that there is a robust and long term evidence based on 1000 patients with 35 countries that omal is going to improve lung function improves exacerbation improve asthma control enhances quality of life decreases ed visits and hospitalization lowers the need for ocs but then the data for lowering of ocs or fe1 reduction is not very robust these are very softer data only so it it helps in significant group of people in properly selected patients so that is typically a allergic uh, uh, you know uh, 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 phenotype let's look at eosinophilic asthma there are three uh, important uh, drugs in fact uh, uh, reslizumab is not available at mepolizumab these two are anti il5 but bendralizumab which is the recent entrant it actually is a receptor antibody it actually takes care of the receptor so the uh, you know il5 cannot sit in and so it it uh, it also not only uh, you know uh, uh, prevents the il5 related response it also increases the natural killer cells by based on antibody de dependent cytokine killing and also that by it reduces e uh, the eosinophil from the tissue also so it's not only about airway tissue eosinophilia eosinophils anywhere will be reduced so it is actually more potent anti eosinophil than anti il5 so it's a anti il5 receptor antibody it's now approved in india it's indicated as an add on maintenance therapy for severe asthma with a eosinophilic phenotype in adult patients more than 18 years that is where it is now indicated the dosage is quite convenient there is a pre filled syringe first three doses are one month and after the three months there will be once in two months so the patient just gets eight in uh, you know vials in one year bendralizumab it binds directly to the receptor it depletes eosinophil within 24 hours in the blood so there is a significant eosinophil depletion in blood and tissue so it binds the eosinophil cells and it recruits natural killer cells as i already spoken to so the natural killer cells also deplete eosinophils uh, by promoting apoptosis of eosinophils so it reduces the blood eosinophilia there is a near complete depletion within 24 hours that's how fast it acts as actually in the blood so if you take a blood eosinophil after it, one or two days after you take this uh, there will be a significant drop in the blood eosinophil and the airway eosinophil which is the tissue eosinophilia there is a 96% change from the baseline at the day 84 so in a uh, in a span of less than 3 months you will have uh, eosinophils everywhere kind of getting depleted it produces near complete depletion in a blood it happens in 24 uh, 24 hours in day 1 in airways there is a 96% uh, at, at the end of uh, day 84 now what happened before bendralizumab came into being there has been a, a, i think this is one of the largest phase 3 uh, you know uh, uh, data that you can ever have on any medication so there is uh, more than 3000 uh, patients involved in all these clinical trials <coughs> sorry you can see there is a kalima and siroco there are these two studies which look at safety and efficacy of bendralizumab in inadequately controlled medium to high dosage which is kalima and high dose uh, inhaled steroids and aba in uh, siroco these two look at uh, you know how it reduced exacerbations in uncontrolled asthma with uh, you know high dose and uh, medium to high dose ics lava so these those people who continue to have exacerbations when there is an addition of uh, uh, bendralizumab there is a significant reduction in uh, you know uh, the exacerbations whereas the zonda study which looked at the uh, ability of bendralizumab to reduce oral corticosteroids in patients who are on high dose ics lava and chronic ocs therapy there is also an extension studies of both uh, kalima and siroco these two were close to one year study there was a further one year extension called as bora this showed that there was a persistence of improvement both in terms of reduction in exacerbation and also in feb1 by bisc study this study was looking at bendralizumab in mild to moderate persistent eosinophilic asthma and finally there is a grigal study which looked at an accessorized uh, you know uh, 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 device 
which uh, at a home setting, the patient can use it on their own home, which probably is very important in situation like COVID, so that they don't even need to come to the hospital. And that was the Grigali study. So these uh, groups of uh, thing, what did it show? What were the results? So Sirocco and Kalima, these were exacerbation studies, and both these had a patient population just similar, which had a uh, poorly controlled in terms of uh, ACQ, higher exacerbations, more than two per year, more than 12 years, severe asthmatics, we, which had a post-bronchodilator reactivity of more than 12%. No specific eosinophilic like cutoff was done at the inclusion. Even a history of uh, uh, eosinophilic population is good enough. And this was typically blood eosinophils more than 300 or I mean, and on high dose ICS lava, they looked at exacerbation rate annually. They, and so for that, they had to do one. <laughs> so it was also a secondary endpoint, which was subjective and objective. <laughs> so uh, they were matched at the baseline. There was both in, in uh, Sirocco and Kalima, both in terms of age, FEV1, scores of uh, subjective scores, e snowfield count and exacerbation. They were matched together around 50 years of age. Poorly controlled in ACQ6. Look at the analysis for people who had more, three or more exacerbations the past 12 months. Both these studies, which showed both in Sirocco, which ran for 48 weeks, and Kalima, which ran for a whole full year, there's a significant decrease. Uh, P value is very significant. There's close to 57% in uh, uh, Sirocco trial and 51% reduction in annual exacerbation rate, especially in people who are exacerbation prone. We've already spoken earlier about the role of eosinophils in exacerbation and found out that anti-eosinophilic, especially anti-IL-5 receptor antibody, reduces this exacerbation to significant proportions, at least close to 60%. Zonde study, which is an oral corticosteroid reduction study, and this space is getting more uh, you know, attraction with a, a, a you know, potente study which is coming up next, which, which will be, uh, you know, uh, available anytime, uh, probably in a week or two, uh, which has shown that there is a phase-wise react a reduction in corticosteroids, which will also tell us how to reduce the oral corticosteroids when the patient is on benralizumab. That is also almost nearing, uh, uh, you know, a publish, uh, publishing. And this Zonde study looked at the primary uh, endpoint was a percentage change in final OC is compared with baseline while maintaining asthma control. So asthma will be maintained and we, cut, we can continue to reduce the oral corticosteroid. So what are the pa patient population? These are typically very severe asthmatics. They have a higher exacerbation rate. Most importantly, they are also on oral corticosteroid therapy. So it can range between 7.5 to 40 milligrams per day of prednisolone for more than six months before enrollment. So before enrollment, these people will come to a baseline steroids, which will be uh, the, uh, the minimum dose that can be used to control that asthma. So that is the running period. And after that, they'll randomize to placebo and benralizumab, following which after about a month, they'll start reducing oral corticosteroids every, every four weeks. So every month they'll start reducing and they looked at it for close to six months. So this is a very elegantly done study, which showed how a role of anti eosinophilic can actually, in a, in a category, in a, in a very methodical manner, improve or reduce the oral steroids. Now, we all know that there are two reasons why steroids are given on a long term. One will be for the severity. That will be taken care of by this. There is also the reason why uh, people continue on a low dose will be as a replacement in relative adrenal insufficiency. In those cases, we might not be able to take it completely, but at least we can get a control so that we can reduce the steroid to the lowest possible rate. That's why it might not be 100% because there might be an element of a, a adrenal insufficiency which might warrant a little bit of a steroid for some group of patients. So let's look at the patient basal characteristics. Obviously, you have severe patients. Average age is about similar. They were on median OCS of up to 10 milligrams and elevated eosinophils despite, uh, uh, you know, steroids. See, look at this. These people had higher eosinophil count despite the patients being on steroids. So these are very severe eosinophilic asthma. These are the ones that really 
will suffer continuously and they'll have a recurrent exacerbation these are the patients whom our heart sinks when we see them outside our uh, clinical opd because every time we see them they invariably come qualifying for an admission and so these people are more seen in emergencies than in op so these are the typical patients that were tested and there were about 75 patients they're not much I mean, it's not like 2000 patients uh, trial like siroco or uh, uh, kalima because these are very very severe patients which uh, need this. so what have all these data shown us siroco and kalima has shown that there is a reduction in uh, year one the bora study which looked at a, a continuation they found out in year two zero exacerbations that continued that were seen in uh, i mean 63 percent of people who were on uh, this trial who were on vendralizumab who had more than more than or equal to three exacerbations per year almost two-thirds of them stopped having exacerbations and Three-fourth of them continue to have no exacerbation, which means there is a continued effect as you keep continuing this ventralizumab. Uh, in Zonde's study, we could see 52% of them coming out of oral steroid. So that is a very significant proportion. So out of 75 patients, as close to 52% of them came out of steroids totally. Remaining had to uh, uh, you know, continue on steroids due to various reasons. So steroid reduction and IL-5 intervention, there is a role of IL-5 intervention in steroid reduction because... That has been found to be seen both in uh, Benralizumab, Nepolizumab, and Dupilumab also, IL-13 also, which reduces this. The difference is obviously the number of people who come out are probably better, but there might be no head-to-head comparison here. But you can see from all the data that were in Nepolizumab and Dupilumab and Benralizumab, you can see the percentage reduction is 50% here, 75% versus 25% in placebo in uh, Benralizumab uh, as one day. And dupilumab also 70% versus 42% in the placebo. And so there is a higher percentage of people who actually came with more than 50% dose reduction. And you can see the odds ratio is highest with the benralizumab. And so uh, there is also an annual exacerbation reduction rate, not only in a pure uh, blood eosinophil, uh, you know, pure eosinophilic phenotype, they looked at also some allergic phenotype, which were seen in the subgroup of uh, Kalima uh, and Sirocco study. This, uh, both these studies, you could find that there were a significant amount of reduction, not only in people who had eosinophilic asthma, this is also in people who had a higher IgE, along with a, a blood eosinophil count. And also, these are post hoc, uh, hoc sub-analysis, which showed that not only purebred eosinophilic uh, uh, phenotype, there is also a phenotype allergic eosinophilic wherein there is both increase in IgE and also positive to aeroallergen. The AAR reduction in patients by atopic status also was very high. So it's both in allergic and non-allergic eosinophilic uh, phenotype. There is a consistent reduction in annual exacerbation rate. So it's not that if you have an allergic uh, eosinophilic versus purely eosinophilic, there is going to be any difference. So if there is going to be any eosinophilic component, Handling that eosinophilic component always reduc uh, reduces the annual exacerbation rate is what this subgroup analysis has shown. So you, you could also have a overlapping phenotype like an allergic and eosinophilic phenotype, wherein if you have to have only one, if you have only one chance of going with a uh, monoclonal antibody, you would rather have an anti-IL-5. Again, that, this is an issue for a debate. There are different ways of looking at it, but it's a very useful uh, uh, you know, study to show that it's not only pure eosinophilic asthma, it's also allergic eosinophilic asthma will have a good improvement with the map and I, I'm sure uh, the other anti-IL-5 also. But this is the only, uh, I mean, this, this is the only thing that was uh, actually second year also done. Uh, so this is shown in Bora study that there is a subsequent increase in FEV1. So it's not only about subjective improvement, not only about reduction in exacerbation, there is also a objective increase in FEV1 from the baseline. You can see 365 ml increase from the baseline. That's a huge amount of uh, FEV1 that can be, uh, you know, uh, done. so is there any safety issues? Because there's always been an IL-5 versus an IL-5 receptor. There is a, you know, complete depletion of eosinophil. Is that going to translate into anything which is, uh, you know, unsafe? That doesn't seem to be any safety issues. Uh, it's been studied since 2010 with more than 68, I mean, around 68,000 patients with bendralizumab. There is no new safety signal associated with the long-term depletion of these nerve fields. 
both in bora up to two years of uh, thing and it's not highlighted any concern with malignancy so far there is also no clinically significant helminth infection during the phase three program despite recruitment in endemic areas including parts of south america and asia which i am sure uh, in uh, in our uh, uh, you know uh, in our subcontinent as well so there has been uh, i mean the only issue was the helminthic exposure because there is absolute tissue depletion also but that doesn't seem to be an a, a thing which came out in a drug safety the safety of eosinophil depleting therapy for se uh, uh, severe eosinophilic uh, thing this came out in a drug safety uh, manual and it just says that there is absolutely no problem and safety is ensured so uh, it, the uh, venralizumab it related to early i mean we said that it's in day one itself there is a, a close 100% reduction in blood eosinophil and sustained reduction in tissue eosinophils compared to mepolizumab and also prednisolone you can see that green is prednisolone blue is mepolizumab and you can see that uh, venralizumab has higher eosinophilic depletion and there has been uh, you know real uh, world effectiveness data also one year data in 130 patients you could see that it's even better there's a 72% reduction in uh, annual exacerbation rate there are i mean this has to be taken uh, you know with the context now uh, this came out in allergy to 2020 by kavanath and uh, group which looked at uh, 33 patients of one year where there was a suboptimal uh, thing uh, response to one uh, uh, you know uh, monoclonal antibody and we substituted there is a in, uh, improvement in benralizumab the, the uh, thing is i think this was clarified uh, i think uh, with dr parmeshwar nair wherein in mepolizumab we are switching i mean we are kind of fixing it at 100 micrograms 100 milligrams if you can increase that 100 milligrams you could still probably achieve the similar uh, thing to benralizumab only thing is it ends up being costlier and that's the reason why in those cases it can it will be useful to switch over from benralizumab to mepolizumab in a hardcore severe eye is not like asthma the lack of response to severe eosinophilic asthma in, in some cases of mepolizumab not all cases some cases might be uh you know taken care of if you increase the mepolizumab dosage but you know it's easier to switch it off because there can be an economical considerations here dose considerations also is quite uh, useful to know that there's only eight as against uh, uh, you know 12 to 13 and uh, 13 to 26 in omalizumab uh, number of doses per year comes down and uh, i mean there are other obvious advantages everything is subcutaneous and uh, there is a pre filled syringe here to summarize uh, you know what i've said it is generally uh, you know uh, predominantly about uh, eosinophilic uh, phenotype and predominantly about benralizumab though there are other uh, you know things that are available eosinophilic airway inflammation is central to exacerbation pathogenesis and poor symptom control in asthma we've seen that there is a correlation between the amount of eosinophils and poor symptom control exacerbations and also uh, you know con- uh, i mean uh, that's been very clearly proven by a very elegant studies uh, and meta analysis targeting this eosinophilic inflammation with anti il5 receptor or anti il5 and that uh, obviously goes without saying reduces exacerbation improves asthma control maintains ocs use in severe eosinophilic asthma metralizumab is equally effective in both atopic and not atopic eosinophilic asthma that was proven by that subgroup in both the kalima and the siroco study extensive long term safety data is available with benralizumab from 2010 and also there is a two year follow up study which showed a persistence of the good improvement benralizumab is the only biologic with every 8 weeks and patient friendly dosing so these are the key summary points and i would like to thank uh, the organizers for giving me this opportunity and also astra for uh, uh kind of uh, uh, you know uh, thing and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions uh, related to this i would submit though that i have some experience with il5 a uh, good experience with omalizumab and my uh, experience with il receptor will will start very soon okay. thank you and uh, thanks apt for giving me this opportunity thanks uh, over to you thomas thank you dr patabi raman that was an excellent enjoyable and effective presentation on biorticals as an dedicated uh, uh, interventional yeah, pulmonologist i think uh, you will be more uh, happy with uh, interventions rather than biorticals but uh, i think uh, uh, the bronchial thermoplasty is something like a love marriage where we are not checking into the caste religion phenotypes or anything like that <laughs> Yeah, uh, but biologicals we have to be just like an arranged marriage probably we have to think of uh, phenotypes 
is not will yes. count the amount of inflammation so many factors or even jadagam of yeah, the patient yeah so uh, i am very eager to hear from you what are the plus points of biologicals compared to uh, bronchial thermoplasty yeah interesting that you asked me that so our uh, you know trust with biologicals increased after bronchial thermoplasty and i'll tell you why so bronchial thermoplasty uh, it is uh, as you said is applicable to any severe asthma only thing is yeah, there yeah, needs yeah, to be yeah, a yeah. reduction uh, there needs to be an fev1 which is actually good enough for them to sustain a procedure a bronchoscopic procedure goes for 45 minutes so patients with preserved lung function i would still think bronchial thermoplasty is effective in terms of it is it has got only a finite amount of uh, thing there is only three uh, sittings and after that there is a, a data wise i think it actually is similar to any of the other things the problem with bronchial thermoplasty is its invasiveness of the procedure is a bit invasive again i wouldn't call it an absolute uh, uh, you know uh, uh, love marriage because he, he, as we all know even love marriage people get into problems in uh, bronchial thermoplasty also if the case selection is not very good and there can be some cases where uh, you know Uh, due to various reasons, uh, the uh, improvement may not be optimal. This happens in about 25% of the time. Having said that, there are now more advances in terms of understanding this to identify whether there is a ventilation mismatch and they are using a complex uh, radiological thing including helium, MRI and I uh, think if you if we can find out there are, there are inhomogeneous uh, smooth muscle uh, uh, hypertrophy which can be uh, brought out by uh helium imaging and uh, some ventil ventilation uh, thing which have been uh, uh, you know explained in toronto that if you can identify those areas you could use a single setting bronchial thermoplasty which is equivalent to a three setting bronchial thermoplasty so there is a significant movement on this side also so you might have a more customized and a more uh, uh, you know uh, elegant way of identifying which patients uh, will fit in with uh, what and also thermoplasty can be used in case the uh, biologicals either fail or the patients uh, have a problem in continuing this the, there is always a difference patients acceptability for an injection is a lot better than an invasive procedure but in biologicals the treatment goes on for years together and that way there is a better economical uh, uh, thing in terms of bronchial thermoplasty so for us it is a bouquet the patient gets a, a buffet of all the assorted uh, thing there will be a significant amount of time spent on explaining why what is important what are the advantages and disadvantages after that we let the patient choose so initially they get excited by the, by the uh, uh, you know the injections because it's easier and subsequently we had patient people crossing over from the biologicals to thermoplasty we had at least few patients who had uh, uh, you know omalizumab did not really get better and we had to use bronchial thermoplasty so there are hybrid combinations also you have uh, 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 you know thermoplasty and uh, followed by biologicals very occasionally and the other way around also so we still not crystallized what works for whom in 100% of the cases but these are very exciting times to handle severe severe asthma uh, thomas yeah thank you thank you i think the topic is open for discussion both topics are open for discussion Dr. Janso, can you check any questions in the chat box? So no questions in the chat box, but we are joined by our senior uh, members of APCCM, Dr. P. Sugumaran sir, Dr. Jai Prakash sir. Sugumaran yes. sir, any comments on this? Thank you, Patavi. I heard your talk only. I'm sorry, I didn't. I was not able to hear Akhil. No, no, no. Fantastic no, no. talk. Pleasure, pleasure to listen to you. Thank you. Very good. You, you always have been. So I, I I don't think I have to add anything more or anything less. I learned a lot. That's all. Thank I you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Agil. I was sorry I didn't hear you. I am so sorry. No problem, sir. Uh, it's been a while. I mean, uh, we, I'm we, sorry. Thank you. That will be true. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, Jay Prakash, sir. Any comments? Uh, Dr. Patabi, Dr. Jay Prakash here. Hello, sir. How are you, sir? <laughs> ah, doing good. Yeah. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, actually, it was an excellent talk. Actually, no. Thank you. I I just want to clarify. Uh, you said uh, uh, blood eosinophil is actually uh, almost equivalent to the sputum eosinophil, which is difficult to do uh, yes, for assessing the airway inflammation, even though which is more specific. Yes, sir. So in uh, the same question, uh, actually, uh, in country like India and all where uh, 
no parasitic infections and more we can yes. really you know look into the blood is no fill which is uh, uh, no a substitute for uh, sputum yes, sir, i think that's a, that's a very valid point uh, so the only thing is uh, if if we uh, if we are looking at what drives the exacerbation what drives the exacerbation then we'll have some ideas so it's it, it will not be taken in isolation so a patient who has had recurrent exacerbations and it's not a single uh, point assessment of eosinophil so if the patient has an exacerbation and that exacerbations they have a higher eosinophils in their uh, thing those patients obviously the eosinophil is one that's driving the exacerbation so if those are the patients then it's not going to be the helminthic uh, uh, you know contribution to that so if you have a uh, context to that elevation of eosinophil so i mean cbc is the most commonly done uh, thing for any exacerbations even in a, a general practice so all we need is just look at uh, whether there is a pattern in increase in uh, 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 eosinophils along with any exacerbation and also there will always be a steroid and if there is a reduction in after uh, steroids in those are the ones that tell you that these are the eosinophil which is driving the inflammation which is driving the exacerbation so if we find out the phenotype it's very incumbent on either whether the uh, uh, incumbent on us to identify whether the eosinophils are driving the exacerbation or is it the allergy i, I mean that will be a lot more of historical uh, thing is there is an exposure to you know allergen uh, induced thing and a skin prick test and find out whether there is a correlation so if you can identify what is triggering an inflammation what is triggering an exacerbation then it becomes easy for us to choose uh, this and uh, you know at least phenotype it as eosinophilic okay okay uh, one more just your opinion suppose yes, there is a patient who is difficult to control yes, and uh, uh, maybe an eosinophilic phenotype yes sir. and a reasonably good lung function and yes, uh, uh, there are two options either to start uh, uh, benvalisubab or other uh, uh, or you are uh, amapolisma or you have an option of uh, doing thermoplasty also now which ah. one you will select uh, as the first one um okay so i mean we were talking about very uh, thing first one will be if there is a hardcore eosinophilic type i would go for a, a anti il pfizer it's either mepolizumab or bendralizumab i think the uh, the first option would be to do a biologicals because it will uh, i mean this is a little more specific and uh, specific for the phenotype so if the patient is a middle aged has a nasal polyp has a typical eosinophilic uh, uh, thing i'll obviously be tempted to use uh, uh, use anti alpha having said that i'll have a discussion with the patients and uh, attenders about uh, both these two so i'll be tempted to start on this and if the patient has an improvement he has a uh, you know option of either continuing with the same thing for a long 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 time or we'll have to see if there is a, a way in which we try to do a thermoplasty and see if that is going to help there are no direct answers though the guidelines including gina will say that use uh, thing so if you have to stick to guidelines i would rather have an anti il5 initially subsequently what we do will depend on how he improves and how much he kind of af can afford this and uh, as against uh, a finite number of procedures in thermoplasty that will be done at a later point sir. so uh, a long story short i'll offer uh, uh, you know anti il5 initially and uh, subsequently it's just going to be a dialogue that continues you have any personal experience of uh, such type of uh, intervention in a single patient yes any sir isolated we, case? yeah yeah we we've got uh, allergic and uh, we've had uh, uh, with omalizumab we have a series of four patients who had failed omalizumab not failed one patient was yeah, yeah. could not continue because he's going to australia so we had to use a thermoplasty so most of them were on uh, uh, omalizumab there was only one patient who failed in thermoplasty subsequently we offered them uh, anti il5 but the patient we lost to follow up this patient came i think from dr dinesh prabhu's uh, 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 reference only he didn't do well after thermoplasty and i i, I mean i uh, the last time we met dr dinesh prabhu we just asked him i said he came back once and after that they, they didn't follow there uh, as well so that would probably a patient because that was an eosinophilic phenotype Th those were the days when there was no vipolizumab also so we couldn't really uh, uh, started at that point we told them that there might be coming it uh, i mean the subsequent thing will be coming and uh, after that we lost so follow up sir okay okay thank you so much yes. agil akil are you there yes sir uh, agil actually it was an excellent uh, no narration of the uh, update of gina just thank a uh, opinion from you uh, uh, what are the what are the drawbacks of the gina guidelines in the context in the indian context 
this update uh, guidance in indian context drawback of jena airlines ah uh, in in our in our context indian context indian context yeah um one uh, most uh, about the grading sir um to start with uh, but then uh, the present jena airlines uh, when we look at it uh, the, throughout the how the jena airlines uh, and all uh, evolved whatever we are practicing and we wanted to practice the uh, guidelines is uh, slowly coming to what we are already practicing which i mean that uh, yes, yes. various steps and various sort of medicines such we are adding like uh, saba prn or the isa format role prn when we are considering the conditions of the patient and the uh, financial issues we were almost following whatever uh, what the jena guidelines is evolving into whatever the guidelines comes one year uh, like 2021 even the guidelines many of the things we were following before like uh, previously most of the guidelines was like based on the spirometric values and then uh, reclassify the severity of asthma now they have taken it off all and uh, just based on whether the patient symptoms are controlled on a particular of medicine particular group of medicines and that especially is taken for the definition using uh, for the definitions of the various severity of illnesses um other thing is like uh, saba and now the patients are who are starting on short acting beta agonist there was a tendency to that they'll keep on using the same thing as a regular medicines or intermittent medicines uh, for so long before coming back to us and uh, by the end of, by like 2019 and 21 guidelines jena also identified it as a problem where the patients will stick on to saba and now made the uh, recommendations to tackle it by bringing two tracks Uh, what do you feel like sir in the clinical practice why i think yeah uh, same same opinion i actually i i am uh, <laughs> happy with your opinion same thing i also have the same so what i am saying like that the acos even though before uh, even before years before acos was defined and uh, brought into the guidelines in clinical practice uh, the veterans and pioneers like you might have face the same issue and have should have been treating this like a asthma bars opd and with almost a medicines what are being in the guidelines now mm-hmm. years back like when you started uh, seniors like you started practicing uh, hello hello practice has yes. been evolved much before the guidelines hello yes so you are audible i think akil had some uh, internet uh, issue uh, uh, am i audible okay. yes sir yes sir okay okay i think we'll uh, uh, you can hand over to some other uh, suman sir am i audible now oh yes yes um so maran sir am i audible now i am we can hear you yeah yeah sure no what i was telling is uh, our clinical practice evolves much before the actual guidelines uh, evolves into the present one thanks but abhi i would like to ask you one how you often you use uh, exhaled nitric oxide as an indicator how often or do you use okay, it not, we, we don't have a fino sir yet and we just ordered for one Ah, so okay. i don't have any experience at all okay. it's been i mean in kwamato there are enough people doing it there are, there are uh, five six centers we yes. we we just are doing it very shortly so very short. yeah okay. i do not but the current jena guidelines uh, they have given they have for uh, excel nitric oxide excel nitric oxide they have taken out they are taking off stress on excel nitric oxide like we can't uh, follow up with that we can't diagnose this because uh, based on that All those changes have been made in Jena twenty twenty one. Only thing is, uh, if the exhalatory oxide is very high, can we predict that uh, steroids will work better? Possibly, and exacerbations possibly. Yes, yes, that may be. And another thing is, uh, how long you should give biologicals? <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I have woken up my from my this thing. I'm it's sorry if I made you time. No, no, I no. hope I have clear time. Uh, yeah, how yes, long yeah. we should give? Absolutely. So there is no upper limit now. As of now. Uh, as uh, it's you have to give it for a long long time 
as far as omal is map because of uh, uh, you know a, a good uh, exp- i mean uh, this is about 20 years of experience so omal is map we have some kind of a clarity after one year we can try and stop and if, if it uh, i mean there are a lot of people who have a problem again so at least 60 to 70% of them might have to restart and go on uh, as far as uh, uh, you know uh, anti il5 is concerned both mepolizumab and bendralizumab there is no role for stopping it in between so it's almost as good as an inhaler as well. that is where we'll have a problem uh, and that is where probably uh patients yeah. might uh, you know uh, kind of compare uh, uh, thermoplasty a little more favorably okay better <laughs> uh, uh patabiram sir thank you so thank you sir thank you patabiram yeah yeah sure thanks adan sir from your experience yeah. uh, after stopping this biologicals yeah. like omalizumab uh, how long the effect persists that's question number 1 and few second months, few months few months, months and when you need yeah. to start someone not... someone on uh, compatibility accuracy therapy what you is can't... the complaints or response sorry sir second question is second question is sir, when we need to restart on uh, biologicals after a gap yeah bearing it yeah. being a bit more expensive therapy than inhalers and yeah. what is the complaints of the patients on being getting started once again okay so the patient who worsened because of stopping and if he improves after uh, uh, he gets back then there is a better compliance uh, uh, if he can afford it he'll usually do it because uh, he's in an exacerbation so it'll be easier for them to comply with it ultimately omalizumab is not very costly so the compliance uh, in india is essentially economics if you if you can afford it it's 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 all fine so if if either this uh, bendralizumab or mepolizumab is going to cost 2500 rupees i think every person will come it will be comfortably on uh, this for a lifetime it's only the cost that actually is putting off uh, a lot of people and so uh, you know uh, ultimately it boils down to how deep your pockets are or how efficient is your insurance premium yeah munif sir any comments nothing it's a nice talk patavi hi Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. Yeah. How are you? All well? Uh, I am going well. Oh yes. Uh, but there is one question is yeah. uh, among the biologicals, uh, uh, which do you prefer? I mean, mepolizumab or uh, bendolizumab? So if it's anti IL five, w- what will be the preference? Well, it no. was uh, previously there was no preference. There was only one available. Now there is two. So again, <laughs> it, it's up to the patient to decide. Now mm-hmm. again, if you look at the data, if you go purely by data, then I would I would look at it this way. If the, if the issue for the patient is going to be steroid reduction, I would rather straight away go for bendralizumab. If it is just going to be an exacerbation reduction, I am just going to uh, say what the cost is going to be, and that would ultimately, uh, uh, you know, decide along with uh, what the patient would feel between a uh, monthly dose versus uh, once in uh, two months dose. So those are the advantages that I have. So again, the patient will choose for me. I, I, efficacy wise. in terms of reduction of exacerbations i wouldn't have looked at all the data closely there is not going to be any big difference between the two of course there is this guys uh, hospital uh, data 32 patients we'll have to read very closely uh, about that because uh, if the patient doesn't get better with 100 micrograms of uh, 100 milligrams of uh, uh, mepolizumab then uh, it, there is a role for increasing the dose versus uh, you know switching it to bendralizumab so uh i would uh, put everything across here any patient who can afford all this i would rather have it a one hit and at this point looking at these data if the patient is going to be uh, on oral steroid i would go directly with the bendralizumab if it is going to be about exacerbation reduction i would uh, just give a, give the whole uh, uh, option to him because there's not going to be much to de- decide between the two so the cost will probably uh, take the uh, uh, thing okay thank you for that one more thing uh, uh, what is your experience i mean have you tried in any patients with mepolizumab so yes i have i have uh, mepolizumab experience i have uh, omalizumab experience uh, bendralizumab no, uh, very short my question is my question is on uh, on patients of uh, so called uh, uh, seos type patients overlap syndromes overlap syndromes yeah so uh, I, I actually only one patient i've started overlap straight away on mepolizumab other was on uh, uh, allergic eosinophilic i just started on omalizumab they failed mepolizumab was not was not there we uh, we offered thermoplasty and that patient is doing well thank you thank you patavi good day ha ji sir yeah 
ഷാജി സാർ ഇനി കമന്റ് ഗോയിങ് ഓൺ ഫയറിംഗ് Yeah, so i was just uh, hearing uh, in the initial part of uh, the, uh, our agil poll uh, okay nice hearing you uh, but abhi let me ask you uh, after what duration you are taking up with this covid patients for interventions <laughs> now covid patients post covid patients we already started doing interventions we we've, we've done uh, i mean all sorts of uh, uh, thing we started uh, i mean malignancies we've had a, a few uh, we had to do a rigid bronchoscopy during covid also we had to do for certain people who had uh, think foreign bodies and now there is a lot of thoracos and mediastinal nodes and uh, uh, you know lavages for fungus and so on so all these things are happening but hardcore uh, interventions uh, 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 the last time we did bronchial thermoplasty was 2 years ago so i mean that uh, i mean all the elective kind of thing uh, uh, they didn't really uh, you know we've not really started yet because they didn't come and there was uh, this covid uh, thing uh, i think uh, uh, akhila told about uh, reduction in asthma during the whole uh, pandemic i mean that's very true there are not much of asthma exacerbation that we had uh, not that we had beds for them also that's a different matter but i think so need for thermoplasty bar biologicals were were all uh, quite quite low and we have started all the interventions at this point all the ebuses are running and the thoracos are running hardcore uh, you know airway interventions have come down considerably and i, I expect it to go up a little uh, subsequent because we are getting a lot of uh, mdr strains fungus yeah, 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 yeah. post covid period uh, yeah, yeah. do you take yeah. up uh, bronchoscopy or just a scotomy evaluation no we we also do bronchoscopic uh, thing uh, biopsies from the for for mucor we usually go for a tissue biopsy than just a lavage and so uh, we we are uh, ending up doing all the guided biopsies and lavages now are you using a cryo for uh, post covid uh, it depends on you know, we for mediastinal nodes we, we started using 1.1 cryo for mediastinal lymph nodes uh, for the biopsy of the mediastinal lymph nodes so those are the exciting things that we are doing but generally uh, for a, I, ild we are not doing any uh, Uh, cryo tblbs we've done one uh, one ild cryo tblb very recently uh, but that was not covid so for covid related uh, uh, interstitial lung disease we don't even bother to do anything they get better on their own yeah okay thank you yeah nice talking to you after hey, long time yes, likewise yeah. likewise you <laughs> know well while. thank you thank you sir uh, reka ma'am any comments okay if there are a, a, any other questions okay if there are uh, no other questions shall we close the session sure 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 okay so today's program is supported by astrazeneca so we'll have a sponsor's time uh, mr devana well uh, uh, thank you doctor <clears throat> in fact uh, good evening to all good evening sukumar and sir good evening um, to rest of all the participants and uh, speaker dr akil and dr patabi raman in fact the high energy talk i only feel that i have added value by uh, taking care of this particular uh, event um, it only makes us feel proud and happy i have nothing more to add thank you so much dr akil and dr patabi raman so we are so happy to be a part of this session thank you so much i just would like to sign off by um, thanking uh, the organizers dr uh, janso and dr thomas vadakan for giving us this chance thank you so much wishing you all good health and safety thank you thank you bye good night bye sir good night everybody for tabi bye akhil bye bye sir so from uh, on behalf of the association of pulmonologists trishu let me uh, from the bottom of my heart extend our gratitude always uh, uh, done justice to that so thank you sir coming in spite of your very busy schedule uh, i would also like to thank dr akil paul who always accepts any invitation which we give so he is again 
uh, weapon for us uh, in our association to use for any uh, meeting and he has readily done uh, given what we always wanted so thank you dr akil paul uh, again on behalf of our association let me also thank the senior uh, members of apccm dr uh, sukumaran sir dr b jay prakash sir muni sir and um, all the doctors who have uh, come here in, uh, with our invitation uh, we acknowledge the presence and uh, are greatly blessed by your presence um let me also thank the senior members of the association pulmonologist trishur dr davis paul dr shaji uh, joseph and all the other members uh, for attending this session and uh, um a special uh, gratitude also goes to the secretary of apc scheme dr jay prakash sir with that uh, let me uh, close the session uh, for fellowship and dinner at your own homes <laughs> thank you sir Thank you, thank, thank you, you all. Have a thank great you. Time you will have to give, Devanand. Uh, done, sir. Certainly, a day would come. Uh, we would catch up. Yes, sir. Uh, sir. And I'll definitely. Uh, we'll have some good times. Okay. Bye. Right, good sir. night. Thank you. Sir. Good Bye. Good night. Sir. Good night. Thank you, sir. Good, good night. night. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Jayprash. Thank you. Good night.